This conference will now be recorded. Thank you, computer voice. Um, all right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to go over just some very, very quick housekeeping. Um, if you were in a little bit of a little bit ago while I was babbling, um, if you're used to coming to our webinars, I'm sure you're used to them looking very differently because we usually use GoTo training. But because I wanted to see cameras and faces and hear voices, we're using GoTo Meeting today. Um, on your screen, you will see how to access the chat and how to access your settings. So if you're having some audio problems or some microphone problems, um, you want to look for that little cog. It may look a little differently if you're accessing this in an app versus the web, but the, the icons should be the same. Um, the other thing is once we have cameras on, which I'm hoping y'all are not going to make me stare at myself for an hour, um, in the middle you should have a little drop down box so you can change what that will look like. Um, if for some reason you're just stuck staring at me and you want to see everybody, um, you can change it that way. And so I'm also going to share out a link. And I've shared it a couple of times in the chat. Um, I want to create a Google Doc today um, for any ideas, suggestions um, that you all have. I'm going to share the link out. Anybody with the link can add to it. So if you're in there while we're talking, um, you may just want to be careful that you're not typing over. Also, I am going to ask that you mute if you're not talking. I'm getting feedback from somebody right now. Um, because I'm having a conversation. No, your mic needs to go. Okay. All right. So I just muted everybody, but I'm going to unmute you all in a minute. Um, I'm going to ask that if you're not talking, make sure that you're muted, please. Uh, it's just much easier if you all can mute and unmute uh, versus me and Dolly trying to run around, especially because we don't have a hand raise button like we do in the other one. Um, but I want to hear your voices. I want your great ideas. This is not a typical webinar. This is a brainstorming session, which means I want it to be very interactive. I want to hear your voice more than mine. If you don't have a microphone, we do have the chat function um, and we're happy to read ideas, questions out into the quote unquote record so that it's captured in the recording. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm gonna turn on my camera. I hope again that you will do the same if you are not already. Um, and now that I'm not sharing my camera, I can see all of you. <laughs> And hi, good morning. All right, so I'm going to unmute all. Um, but again, if we start running into a lot of background noises, we'll start muting individual um, people. If you're working from home and you have an animal, please share. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to open up the floor and see does anybody. Um, Children's programming, are we all going virtual? Is anybody doing distance in-house programming yet? Let's hear it, let's hear from you. We started doing um, drive-in story times a few weeks ago. Ooh, how did, all right, tell. So, um, so they're just starting. I mean, we, we, we're uh, just trying to build an audience for it, um, but uh, there's definitely interest. Um, they've been fun. I mean, obviously, we'd much rather be regular in-house, but there's we don't have any idea. For summer, like, we're still planning on just basically doing the drive-ins, and we do, like, once a month Zoom parties. But the drive-in story time, we, we got the um, transmitter, um, and I mean, it's, it's super simple. I mean, just set up outside. We have them park uh, alternating spots. So that way, if they want to get out of the vehicle um, and stand in front of their car to do our dances and stuff, they can. Um, and then, um, uh, we know, we have a little make and take that we give them a giveaway at the end. Do you have a way for them to see the book as you read it? Or is it just kind of they get to hear the story? 
Yeah, there's what we've we've done. We've made a few like big props, like when we did Leonardo the Terrible Monster, we made like big paper monsters. So we, you know, which normally we do our story times, it's one person doing it. Now we're kind of having a tag team, so one person can run past the cars with like huge props and stuff. So instead of having like we were doing a a, a weekly um, alphabet themed story time, we let the alphabet theme go, and our theme is purely just fun now. So whatever fun books we can find that lend themselves to like, you know, there's some, you know, some people we, I can tell off the top of my head if, you know, if, like some Robert Munch stories. So stuff like that, anything that's like, like super duper interactive or anything you can make super big props for that your, your partner can run past the cars, you know, that that's pretty much what we're doing. Do you block off the parking lot just for like one area? Just, and like, I guess how many people? Yeah. So it depends. Like we have, uh, we have a few different branches and, Oh, uh, technically five, but there's only two of them that this really works for um, because our actually main library, we can't do it there because just the way the parking lot works, you can't really block off a section without it being a mess. But most of the branch that's on a college campus, uh, that's got a huge open area that's very easy to block off. And the same for our smaller branch in the North County, there, there's this two separate lot, um, parking lots kind of, so we can block off one and that's, what we're using. So the one of them is kind of limited. We're only going to probably be able to do say 12 cars at a time at that one, but the other one at the college campus, we could probably do 30 cars if we wanted to. And Patty, and you don't have to do this right now, maybe later in that Google doc. Um, can you share, you said that you purchased a transmitter. Can you share the information on that? So if somebody's interested, um, but they're not yeah. sure. Um, what they're looking for, um, that might be a good starting point for them. That would be wonderful. Yeah, I'll add all of the equipment that we used for that because it was, you know, this transfer we have is a simple one. It wasn't crazy expensive. And um, we plug one microphone into that. The microphone stand is really helpful. And then um, for our music, you know, I just, there's just a little um, adapter that I just plug into that and I can play our, our music right off my phone into it. I know we have a transmitter because we've done drive-in bingo instead of drive-in story time. Um, and I know we found ours on Amazon. It was a couple hundred bucks. So in the scheme of things for what we're doing, it's not that expensive. Um, but it usually it has a mic and an aux port so that you can run music and you can run a microphone at the same time. So. Yeah, we're getting a lot of chatter that it seems like most people are speaking virtual or most people who are responding. Oh, so okay. it. oh you got it? Yeah, well, I mean, he was on, we're trying to get into the wrong. Oh, is this it? I, I have a question for Pat. This is Amy Jane McWilliam with the Lee County Library System. Okay. Sometimes when we propose, you know, offering a new service or, or kind of getting back to some some other programming services, I have to like anticipate all the questions from our administration prior <laughs> to even meeting with them. So one of the questions I know I, I would get is, so we you encourage people to stay in the car, but if they wanna get out of the car, they can. Do you see a lot of congregating after the story time among families or they pretty much like pack it up and go? Yeah, we've only done, like I said, uh, three now I think right. there's three we've done so far and it's been small crowds been like four or five cars um and they have yeah it, they, they uh took that you know we will make and take and they took off yeah which I was that was, was something I was fearful for that they would do that and then they'd all come into the department at the same time but they really they really haven't so so far so good <laughs> I imagine it's a nice break from the computer screen as well yeah I mean <laughs> that's the issue we were having is our story like the we were doing facebook live story times and we started trying to do them on zoom and for us like we just weren't getting anybody to turn in anymore like you know so we're like you've got to try something different and lydia yeah. from the museum of florida history uh is part of the part because you're, you're still you're still close to the public but she's planning on creating programming that translates Virtually, 
I'm just going to pull up the motivation hybrid models. Um, has anyone been doing hybrid? Casey, I couldn't hear your question. There seems to be a lot of background static going on. I'm gonna um, over here. I'm gonna manually mute some Colin. Um, if I have muted you, or if Dolly has muted you, and you need to speak, uh, but just a reminder: if you're not speaking, please mute. Uh, So Lydia had mentioned that there, are, she's trying to plan for the Florida History Museum, um, some kind of a hybrid model for programming because our our building is so close to the public here in Tallahassee, and we were in the same building as, as the History Museum. Um, and so I know Jessica said too that they're starting hybrid programming for their family story time and baby time. Um, and so I'm just curious if other people have started to adopt a hybrid model, and if so, what which programs are, are working really well for you? Hey, <clears throat> um, I'm in Leon County, and we haven't started doing hybrid programming yet, um, but at any time that the county says that we can um, open up for you know in-person programming we'll try to adapt to hybrid programming um, but in the meantime we are doing like zoom story times every day of the week and we have um, adventure bags planned for the summer they've done really well for us and we've been doing them for all different kinds of programs now um, we started them last summer and we had a different adventure bag each week um, with a different fairy tale and then we did them um, We've been doing them for 4-H every month, and we are doing them every week of March and every week of April for different, in March we have um, our NEA Big Read, and then in April we're doing a huge celebration of autism and neurodiversity, and we're giving out adventure bags for those programs. So they, like in April, they're going to be sensory steam adventure bags, so they'll have directions for a project, and then all the items that you need for that one project, and then additional um, additional projects in there and then in the summer we'll have like different projects and we'll have materials for one or two different projects um, and then um, we'll have like a lot of you know four or five other like mazes and stuff and we'll have a reading like a list of recommended reading um, so I, we expect those to be really popular we have planned to we plan to give out 1200 of those each week in the summer at all of our I mean throughout our whole system yeah, and Christine, there's a question for you in the chat. Can you elaborate a bit more about what an adventure bag is? Adventure, what we have, what we're doing, an adventure bag would be a paper bag, um, like a party paper bag kind of thing. It's just a plain paper bag I can show you. Um, uh, actually, there's too many boxes in the way, but anyway, it's just a like a plain, you know, like a nine inch paper bag, no handle or anything. They're very cheap. You can get them for like 10 cents at, Dollar Tree. Like um, a lunch bag? Yeah, like a lunch bag. Uh, exactly. Except for you can get them in color, like white or other colors. Um, and then we just put stuff in them. Like um, sometimes there are only paper activities, um, which would be like mazes and coloring sheets and word searches and instructions for different things you can do, um, paper folding and stuff. But our better, like even better, is when we can include other things. Um, I think last year we did a, a catapult, like it was rubber bands and popsicle sticks, and, um, make the catapult and then included the directions. We also had like a fire, a fire dragon. Um, one was like a card that you could make with a dragon. Um, so just different activities, basically they're steam or craft activities. And last summer we had a story in each one because of our, our theme was fairy tales. But this summer we'll just have a recommended reading rest. We won't have a story. Um, we have a question in the chat too, uh, asking for an explanation of what um, programming is. Um, I'll sort of give you my perspective and then if anybody else has anything to add, because I'm sure this looks different everywhere 
Um, but yes, typically hybrid programming has um, some sort of a virtual element and then some sort of a hands-on element. So a lot of libraries have been doing take and make craft kits where uh, patrons can pick up craft kits, take them home, and then later the li at a scheduled day and time, um, the library will then go live with, you know, it can be attached with story time or just some kind of an activity where they're then going through that craft kit together or that scene kit. And so, um, and so they're able to do it on their own if they want, but then there's also sort of a, a come together program time virtually. Um, but again, if anybody else has anything to, to explain that better than I did, <laughs> please feel free. I'm with the St. Lucie County and we're planning for the summer events to be able to do like uh, steam experiments um, and we'll offer them the week of and then we'll release a video that same day so they come to the library get a bag of everything that they need and then they can watch the video online and do the experiment as a family or individually and kind of go through the entire thing on their own with the step-by-step -step instructions that we give um, online for them to be able to follow. Hey, this is Kate with Columbia County. We do something really similar. Um, last summer, we were entirely virtual. We did take home steam kits and um, we included the instructions in the kit, everything they would need. But then on a specific day, we would go live on Facebook and do like a how-to video that they could join in and follow along. And then of course, we left it up. So that way, if they couldn't watch it, at that time, they could go back and do it again. Um, that's what we're doing for spring break this year. We're calling it Steam Break. It's super popular here. Um, we're hoping to go hybrid for the summer. Um, so we do something really similar. But just like he was saying, that we'll have them in person. We'll also offer a virtual element. But it's basically the same. Um, this is Amy again with Lee County Library System. Uh, for summer reading, we're planning on doing um, like grab and go activity kits, kind of like what um, Christine and Gabe and Kate were talking about. Um, the pre-K will have like activity sheets and, and rhymes and things that parents can do at home. And then K through five, we're doing, um, we're going to be going with Page Turner Adventures. Uh, again, we got a great rate for six weeks for all 13 of our locations. Um, and we're going to provide activity kits that correspond with their weekly craft videos um, so that kind of takes the um, the effort off of our staff when it comes to putting all of that together for k through five for six through eight we're looking at live um, interactive programs like folding origami how to draw anime our teen program really um, consists of middle schoolers so we are embracing that and, and focusing on that um, uh, that that age group for the teen program um, although it's open to all teens, but um, we're also looking at offering, and this is this is going to be separate from SRP, but we're hoping to rope some teens in um, to SRP through this program um, called Summer of Service, where we invite a guest speaker to talk about, you know, an issue that's facing our community, and teens can come and pick up like a, a supply kit at the library and complete an activity at home and return it to the library and get service hours because that is what teens want from us. <laughs> they want the high school teens, they want service hours, and we're trying to be creative, and the guidance counselors can kind of, uh, they can be flexible too. So, um, you know, being able to do page turner, being able to use um, outside vendors for some of the teen programs allows us to be, um, to make our, our high school teen uh, summer program really special and unique. Um, also with the K through five program, we are um, we realized last year with Read Squared, we we issue we create these activity booklets um, that are paper that include like a reading challenge and and connect the dots and all these fun things. And then um, there's a reading log as well. But if children participated in the that activity booklet, that's it. They they didn't get um, entered to any into any of the contests. Um, with with read if they participate in read squared they get in, entered into win like branch prizes and weekly prizes and grand prizes which were really cool um, that was kind of unfair <laughs> so this year um, we're creating a similar program with the activity book and the read squared challenge.
but kids who complete the activity book um, will be eligible to win um, some really cool Chris. prizes, even if they can. Yeah, I never wrote those in the book. I need to write all those in the book. Dennis, right? Hey, Paula McCann, can you mute yourself, please? Paula, thank you. Oh, okay, so this is what we're looking at for the service hours, Christine, um, for the teens. So for example, I might have animal services come and talk to us about, you know, stray animals, um, people who, you know, animal abuse, um, that sort of issue, uh, you know, when we see stray animals in the community, right? And so one of their, their assignment might be to create a poster um you know talking about animal abuse or create a poster and this was actually in the cslp manual create a poster featuring an an, a, an animal that's up for adoption and then they can turn it in at the library and then animal services would use that um that's just that's just that's a maybe um another one might be um uh the homeless coalition it might be assembling a kit um or in making a card so they'd get items to put in a little kit for um, for the homeless and veteran services, and they would create a card or something like that. Um, animal toys, cat toys, um, we're, we're, we're working on that. It's um, uh, placemats for meals for meals on wheels. Um, so something that would take a little bit of time. They are participating in the interactive portion where they're listening to the guest speaker. So that would be included into the volunteer time. So it's a little bit of civic engagement, a little bit of volunteer time. Um, and I, I do wanna step in for just a minute, um, not to cut this conversation up, but um, I do wanna make sure that we're focusing on the children's age group for today's discussion. We do have a separate time set aside for teens um, because I know that not everybody works with the teens. Um, and so um, not to cut you off, Amy Jane, because this is great conversation, but I do want to make sure because our time is limited that we're sort of focusing on the, the target audience at hand for today. Um, and yes, and, and Amy Jane said she'll be there in the team talk too. So we can definitely pick more, more of your brain for this. Um, um, I know that um, you mentioned Read Squared too. For anybody who maybe didn't hear, CSLP did release a whole new batch of artwork for uh, Read Squared and the other, you know, sort of digital, if you're not doing physical reading logs. Um, so that is also available to you now if you purchased access to that online manual. Um, so that is also available. Um, and so I know page turners was really popular last year. Um, in the last few minutes before we end today, I am going to pull back up that Google Doc because my hope is just in the coming week, you all will take a few minutes to sort of pop in there and fill out some information just to share so that it's, you know, kind of this big collective. Um, is there anybody who used um, other, other performers, other virtual performers outside of page turners? Um, just for some variety. <laughs> and then we also did have a question in the chat um, from Jessica saying that they are more of a crafter than a scientist. So um, if anyone has any recommended resources for simple STEAM projects, if you could drop those links in the chat, that would be great. Um, or of course, if there's something you wanna talk about, we are gonna save the chat so that we can pull all this great information out as well. I know um, last year we did uh, the Party Palace since it was fairy tales. So every Thursday night we would have our performers. And so they did theirs. They sent us a video, whether it was Elsa reading or Peter, Peter Pan reading a story. Um, so those could be a really good resource too. Just any kind of, uh, what are they called? I'm looking for a word, um, programmer, or character place, party place. They could be a really good resource too. Our, the place we actually used was from Alabama because I know the owner. I went to school with her. And so they were super helpful and very accommodating for what we needed. And they are also struggling too. So they're willing to do what, do all the different things that we needed for to be able to perform for a library. So those could be a super good resource that you normally wouldn't think about for a library program. Yeah, 
And Mary should really do a food ads lab so that they recommend that. Um, lots of suggestions coming in the chat, which is wonderful. Um, Angela said they're uh, using animal tails this year, which um, is right in keeping with the theme. And I know they've always done such a good job with in-person um, as well, but they're doing pre-recorded. Bright Star Theater offers live interactive plays. Citrus County is thinking of going virtual with Spears Bubble Magic Show. Um, you can purchase a link for unlimited access, and he was on America's Got Talent. Um, and I'm not going to read out loud every single one of these. I'm just trying to pick and pull some <laughs> for those who don't have a microphone. Um, for quick, easy STEAM activities, um, for the April bag that one of the April bags that I'm doing, um, I did that we're making like my favorite ever super easy steam activity and it's a water bead stress ball and you can see i've got one here that i can't stop playing with and so you do the water beads and then you put them in a balloon and they are just amazing to look at and it, it's firm so it's good as a stress ball um kind of obsessed and it was um you know, I can't remember the exact price, but if you're interested, I can email you. Um, but uh, it was less than a dollar per bag. You could totally sell it as like fish eggs or something and going with the animal theme, right? <laughs> we, I also sent out stress balls uh, in a teen kit that we did with flour and balloons, which also was way less than a dollar per kit as well. So if you don't have water beads or can't order them in, you know, flour and little baggies you can get at the dollar store as well as balloons. So it's a cheap alternative as well. Some other ones that um, I'm doing are like a rain stick with a toy, like a, a paper towel tube, except for I had to buy them pre paper towel. But, um, and then um, it's really easy and it makes a cool rain stick noise because you put tin foil in the middle and then rice. And um, also a water or a glitter, a calming glitter jar. You put like glitter and a little bit of clear glue and water in there and it you know, you shake it, it kind of is like a snow globe um, with glitter and um, a fidget bracelet. That's also pretty cheap and easy. Um, and uh, uh, binoculars made out of toilet paper rolls. Yeah, and Teresa just shared the link to uh, Project Wild. Uh, which is through our Florida Fish and Wildlife. And I know that some of you all were with me, you know, 20 years ago in October. <laughs> it feels like 20 years ago. Um, the year before last, I think, my time, I don't know about y'all, but I can't tell time anymore. The passage of time just ceases to be um, where they actually did an in-person training for us. And so Project Wild uh, is really great. They've got online resources. Um, and they focus specifically on the Florida ecosystem. So it's things that are specific to Florida, uh, which is really great, you know, again, keeping in with the summer theme for the, the tails and tails. And so if you haven't had a chance to check them out, or if you were at that training and you have that massive workbook that might be, you know, might have spent the last year and a half collecting dust, might be worth pulling back out to see, um, you know, Florida specific creating scavenger hunts and things like that. They also the have different scavengers. books on different levels too, which kind of makes it nice. Yeah, and they aligned the curriculum with the school requirements too. So if that's something that your, you know, your library just happens to look at of, you know, what does this align with for, you know, not clearly not a school educator. There's a specific term, um, but yeah, it's great. And Teresa said that she's a facilitator for Project Wild and would be happy to check on leading a workshop online. Teresa, you will be hearing from me as soon as this brainstorming session is over. 
<laughs> I actually uh, took my binoculars and added a um, Project Wild um, scavenger hunt. <laughs> so that was definitely an excellent resource for planning the summer. Hey guys, I wanted to share this real quick. Um, this is something that we're doing for spring break, so it's kind of wish I saved it for the summer, but whatever. Um, this would be really easy for everyone to do. I reached out to my local um, Audubon chapter. It's Four Rivers Audubon. They're really great. And we kind of collaborated on a super easy steamy bag take home project. Um, so in the kit, they have materials to make their own little DIY bird feeders. This is super basic. It's like a paper ice cream cup. And then this is a straw because it's what I have. They'll be getting dowels. And they make their own bird feeders to hang in their backyard like that. And then what I got from the Audubon Society was a list of local birds that during the spring break time frame will be visiting the bird feeders that they would put in their yard. And I made a little photo scavenger hunt. I know it's kind of hard to see, I'm sorry. But that way they can watch their bird feeder and kind of like match the different species that, that could be there. So it's like a bird visiting scavenger hunt. So on the one side, I have our instruction sheet and everything's backward, I'm sorry. So it has like a photo of the project and the complete instructions. And then I have ideas for sturdier um, bird feeders and recycled materials. And at the bottom, I have both our logo and the Four Rivers Audubon logo and like a notification of when our live video is going to be for like instructions and stuff. But that took me like an hour or less. It mostly just took me a while to hear back from the Audubon Society, but they were super nice. So I definitely recommend reaching out to them. That's awesome. You're getting a lot of kudos in the chat for that too, by the way. <laughs> I kind of feel like me and Heather are a little bit of the outliers here um, because we are actually doing in-person programming um, at our tiny little Wakulla branch, um, as long as there's registration required so that we can keep the numbers small and so that we can have everyone spaced out. Um, and we're going to attempt to have in person over summer, uh, but we have also been instructed to try and set up virtual stuff as well. Um, so I kind of feel like I don't know how, how we can help each other with with most of you being virtual and some of you being virtual in person um, besides what we've done already through the past year. Well, and I, I think um, just based on some of the conversations I've heard, not only here, but in other meetings, I, I, I know that there's usually seems to be a lot of interest in finding out for people who are starting to do in-person programming, how libraries who are doing it are approaching it and handling it and, and doing it safely. And it, for us doing it in person, it's been very weird because bird, you're not supposed to be in the same room as people and then you're having to read not to your computer or camera again and I didn't think it would be that much of a oh I had people stop and say oh yeah I know what animal that is and I'm like, yeah it's a giraffe so I it's a it's you're having to go back again and go okay this is our new normal um but it was at first it was really really strange but uh it, it is good to see the kids so we're getting there I think we're getting there, which is a good thing. So to answer Jessica, um, in person, we, first of all, we, we talked our director into buying the software um, for scheduling rooms that allows for a sign up. Well, like you can give them four or five and they can arrange it however they want. Yeah, exactly. And I gotta make it That's good enough for the adults. It's more the adults. Y'all <laughs> are unmuted. Oh, um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, so, so we, our county does not have a mask mandate and we are not required, patrons are not required to wear masks into the building. Um, we do recommend them. Uh, most of our families that come for programs are wearing masks. 
I would say 99% of them wear masks while they're in the programs with the exception of the itty bitties who are gonna rip them off every five seconds anyway. Um, but it, like Heather said, it's been really weird for us. Um, and it's it's trying to gauge that, oh yeah, no, you can't you know be that close to me um, because you know a toddler's excited to see you and they're gonna come and hug you, um, which we have encountered and it's still really weird. Like, oh my God, human, human interaction. It's just, it's really, really odd um, feeling, but it's been nice to see our patrons again. Um, I know for Lego Club, which obviously Legos are germy and gross and everyone's gonna touch them. Um, but we are lucky enough to have them sorted out into bins. I have exactly 20 bins. So I, and I have a big enough room that I can have exactly 20 kids. They each get one bin, they're not allowed to share. They're not allowed to touch all the people and animals and things. I dig through that bin for, for them. So to try and keep down the the community touching of the Legos. Um, and then those Legos are quarantined for two weeks anyway, because that's how long it is in between the programs. Um, so how did we get the in-person approved? Um, our director looked at us and said, do it. <laughs> yeah, uh, we were told by the county. <laughs> so, um, but that that's, Heather, do you have anything else to kind of throw in there? Um, it It is a lot. It is a lot more work than it used to be um, in in person programming between like the sanitizing and trying to make sure like we we had hour long programs. We size them down to 30 minutes now to just limit exposure. Um, so it's it's a lot faster paced and we have um, take and makes. So I tell them oh, we're like this week was dental help and I had like little mouths printed out and they're counting the marshmallows for the teeth that correspond with that mouth. So that's what they took home. Um, so it's a really fast program, um, but it, it does take a lot longer to clean and sanitize and get ready for the next program or the next time somebody's gonna be in that room using it. Um, so that's definitely something to keep in mind um, before you go into having in-person programs. Yeah, and I imagine the uh, if you're not really in tune with what your local school systems are doing, if you're, you know, if your library is exploring the idea of opening, um, that it might be worth checking in to see how they are handling it. I know just with with my mom hat, um, our school does things, especially with special area, very similarly to. Uh -oh. Did y'all just lose me? We can still hear you. We can't see you. Okay, I can't see you either. That that is that is weird. Um, good old tech. I think y'all are all coming back to me now. <laughs> and I will make it a point not to break out in really bad Celine Dion song. Not that the song is bad, but my singing is very bad. Um, all right, I see you again. Um, but yeah, so a lot of the school systems have had to figure out how to work this too and how to get supplies to kids without cross potentially, you know, cross contaminating germs. And so that might be um, just another, another good resource for how to do that. So we have about 20 minutes. Anybody else have a, a great idea? I love that some of you all brought props. <laughs> One of the things that we're working on that I'm hoping they'll we'll go ahead with is um, like going to an offsite location to do story time this summer. It wouldn't have like a live audience, but we would be, you know, at the Tallahassee Museum with the animals or at Cat Cafe with the cats or something like that. Um, I'm really hoping that's going to work out. We haven't really done hardly any. I mean, we only have one book club that meets at a cafe. I think that's the only offsite programming that I can think of that we've done in the past. So it's all it's kind of new, but I think it'd be so cool if like once a week, one of our story times 
went to an off-site location to film if we're not doing any in-person programming. So, so Christine, with animals, we, it's perfect. Christine, me and Heather did that last summer when um, we went full virtual. Um, if you need to, I think some of them are still on Facebook of us dressed up like pirates and things. Um, <laughs> we went out to like St. Mark's, um, places where we know we can go that are open to the public still, um, but where we would be in person with like a whole bunch of people. Um, so we tried to cover places around our county that maybe the kids haven't been to and it kind of fell into our theme um so it, it's interesting and it's a lot of fun and at least it gets you kind of out of your bubble a little bit if you're gonna go and stir crazy from being virtual for so long one thing that our system has been doing is the story walks um we've partnered with the, the oxbow here in st Lucie county which is basically a nature center um, we've had a lot of uh, great feedback from families that have really enjoyed it. We've also done it at a couple of our other branches that have kind of a, a area that allows them to be out in nature and be able to read a book. And uh, I am not myself gifted with artistic value, um, but I have a lot of people that work with me that are, and they've done a phenomenal job of being able to splice the books up and be able to put them on boards and um, make them look really good. And uh, a lot of families have enjoyed not only getting into nature and being able to offer programs during these times, but also being able to read while they're doing it. And it's been, it's been really popular. Uh, we've had anywhere between 20 and 60 people show up, uh, depending on the day and the weather and all that stuff. Hey, Gabe, how do you, how do you track your numbers for that? Oh, <laughs> that um, we've been tracking our numbers by the, um, we just have a little clicker and as, as uh, parents come through, we set up a little table at the beginning and they come and talk to us and then they go through and then when they come back to us, they tell us how they liked it. We have some uh, make and takes that they can go that go along with the story and stuff that they can take with them um, and do at home and things like that. So you guys are actually out there, the story walks only up for what, like the day and you pull it up? Yes, we uh, put it up for the day. It's, we run from 10 a.m. till 12 p.m. Uh, we put all the stakes up and we get there about an hour beforehand just to make sure that the weather is going to be good and that we have time to set up with any issues that may occur that may come up. Um, and then they all, all it is, we, re, we don't require a face mask, but we do encourage it um, because it is outside. A lot of people don't, but there are some that do. Um, and th that's, yeah, that's how we do it. it it's super easy. Um, once all the boards are made, that's a very time consuming part of it. Um, but once the boards are made, we have about 16 stories, I believe right now that we're rotating through. And I know that there are some libraries out there that have permanent story walks. Um, I know Kara put that in the chat. So I'm, I'm curious too, for those who have a more permanent installation, are you able to track usage? Um, if so, how? Um, and I know like anytime story walks come up and people start talking about permanent installations, there's usually a lot of questions about how did you get it? How much did you pay for it? What do you use? So if you have that kind of information, please, please share. My name's So Yuki. I'm with the uh, Booker Atone Public Library, and we were rolling out the story walk, our first one before um, the pandemic hit. So we had our friends funded and we partnered with Palm Beach County um, Research Management because our second location is next to um, a natural area called Pond Hawk. So we partnered with them because um, it's on their land. And um, I think we got them from Barking Dogs, the permanent installations, they were about four or $5,000. And so, but because we're partnered with them, the first time we cut apart the books, but they really fell apart really quickly because it was during the summer. So like they faded really bad. But now they're, um, they're printing it for us using their fancy UV printer. And so the colors look really well. And so we're now on a schedule where we um, update it every two months. Um, and because it was so successful and so popular, now we added another one with one of our other parks. Um, and that one's kind of more for the little ones because it's next to a playground. So also funded by the friends. And that one, like the process, we started in December and we're already, it's already up. So like once you kind of do it, you know, you get into it. But I do like Gabe's idea of like maybe showing up one day with like a little, a little table and a little kit. And it's like, hey, you know, just because right now we have not had any, um, stats you know we we encourage people to tag us on social media 
um, and we have gotten really good feedback that way, but it's like, I don't know, you know, and it's it's a mixed uh, mixed bag too. We have adults saying, when's the next one going up? So um, it is definitely something, again, that is very COVID friendly, but I wish we could get more stats out of it. I'll put um, a link to our website. Um, and if you guys want to contact me, I can, you know, hook you up with the, the other info. We do, we have a permanent installation story walk at our local park and we don't buy the books because the the story walk books because they're really expensive but you can get around that by purchasing two of the same story and like copying uh cutting them and putting them on a board but we actually put ours on black poster board and get the entire thing laminated before we put ours in um which we've tried it a new way this time so hopefully it'll streamline it for us because it takes becca and i all day long and it's painful but hopefully this will be better but we are now just laminating just the poster board and the story separately and we add in um guided questions along the story and um people love it um but we use a big printing company in tallahassee to laminate for us a harvest printing they they are wonderful if anybody gets to use them um but we got ours done by the friends and I highly recommend it. It's such a good way, but we can't keep statistics either. Um, but it's still, and the QR code was one of our ideas to be able to keep a stat, but you know, why read when you come to the library or do any other library programming? So, um, but anyway, uh, story walks are a super great resource to be able to put out in the community. We've also just emailed and asked for permission, you know, and a, and a lot of publishers have granted it as for a year for free. Um, I think we've only had to pay for one book and because the friends are funded it, we were able to pay for it and it was like a hundred for the year for the rights. So, um, so everyone's been pretty nice, you know, so it is, it is good to plan ahead and just, you know, ask. All right, guys, I gotta go to the meeting. Thank you for the good ideas. Thank you for joining us. Um, and Catherine did say that they, they use a QR code for theirs. Um, I don't know, I'm a little bit behind on the chat. So if I ask a question that's already been answered, sorry. And Ruth, how we make ours accessible to everyone. We did our first, our first storyboard we put up. I got a phone call the very next day and it wasn't, oh, this is wonderful. Thank you guys for doing this. It was literally, how are the blind kids supposed to read the story? Where's the braille? And I had been working for five months to get this to happen. And so we worked with the Division of Blind Services to figure out how in the world do we put Braille on a storyboard and do it for every single book that one, it was not even in the realm of the stuff we could afford. And two, when we talked to the Division of Blind Services, uh, they have to be guided to when there's Braille. So there was no point in us even doing that. So we now put a QR code on each board that links you to a video of us reading that storyboard. So whether it's myself or Rebecca, we will read that board so they can, anybody can read it. So as long as they scan the QR code, it's getting read to you. Um, and there's lots of information. I know someone had asked, um, said that they were interested in sort of materials that people are using for this. Um, and so there's a lot of information going in the chat. And again, we will share the chat out in the follow-up email. So if you're you're missing stuff, no worries there. Um, Catherine, I would be curious with the QR code. Um, I know you don't really have a way of knowing, you know, what percentage of people going through are actually using that QR code, but are you seeing stats coming in through that QR code? Yeah, Jessica said they've tried implementing the QR code too, but people just don't use it. Um, oh, Alyssa said they did a story walk that had people steal their signs. That's not fun. That's kind of where the permanent installation thing comes in handy. They can't steal it. <laughs> they can damage it, but they can't steal it. Um, because we, we considered doing a portable one so that we could move it for, to the various parks. And it finally came down to, we know 
the people in our area and someone would take take one or all of it or damage it irreparably so we decided that we needed to do a permanent one instead i would say if you're going to do a story walk that it's going to be mobile like that and something that can be taken or pulled out of the ground that you would need to have it during certain times and have it manned by somebody that works at your library um, that's really the only way you're going to ensure that you are able to use it multiple times and nothing's going to happen to it um, Rhonda said they've been doing a story hunt in their parks. Um, and Rhonda, you've gotten some interest on that. I don't know if you have a, a microphone or if you want to just share more information in the chat, but we we are asking for more info on what it is, how you do it. Uh, Rhonda said we use QR codes that link to stories on YouTube and we have a secret code word on each one. They get a card at the library and then go around to fill it out and bring back for a bag of candy. That's very cool. I mean, you can get my kids to do almost anything for candy. <laughs> um, Amy Jane says they've asked to start with a non permanent structure just to give them the flexibility to get feedback and move around if necessary. Lots of other people dealing with story walk damage and having to replace pieces and bits. Oh, now Peggy said theirs are in business windows on Highway 90. Um, and I think I read, um, it wasn't in Florida, but I was reading something about a story walk in another small town where they partnered with local businesses to hide book character, like silhouetted book characters in the windows of businesses in their downtown area so that they could sort of go window shop for those as well. Here I said one in Boone, North Carolina, super cute. We have about eight minutes. Is there something we haven't touched on? Oh, you got a question. What's needed to have or start a story walk? So does somebody who started one from scratch want to sort of share how you started? Uh, one of the things that we did is we had kind of all of our children's people come together and say, okay, what books do we want to um, have on this? Uh, the other part was purchasing all the uh, wooden stakes to go in the ground because ours is uh, mobile. It goes around to different branches at different times. Uh, we also had to purchase the uh, actual poster board uh, to put it on um, and then it took a, a team of about four people working diligently um, to kind of we had to order two of each book so that we had enough to put on all the um, story what the whole book was on the there and numbering them we found was important uh, especially when putting them up having one through 26 rather than having to go through all of them to try to figure out exactly which book which page went where and all that stuff um, so it, it kind of simplified the setup for us uh, as well. And uh, kind of putting all that together and, and figuring out the costs and all that was kind of how we got started. Yeah, and there's lots of good questions in the chat about, um, you know, how do you get permission to use a book for story walk? Um, making sure that um, if people are using story walk, I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, um, Catherine said you need to make sure you credit the original creator of the story walk. So I'm assuming it's that you're, you're getting a story walk that somebody else created. Um, yeah. I know Go ahead. At the beginning of all of our story walks, it gives credit to the original creator up in Vermont, uh, Montpelier, Vermont, where they started it. Um, she kind of she doesn't require you to um, give her any money or anything like that. She just wants credit for what she came up with. And then of course, people are sharing a lot of wonderful resources in the chat, lots of links. Um, and then Amy Jane said, if you're working with your parks department, work out who is responsible for maintenance and upkeep, swapping out stories, et cetera, before you install. We've got six minutes. Um, I do, um, thank you, Kate. I do want to, um, I'm going to hop back over and share my screen really, really quickly on this Google Doc 
um because whenever i send out the video i will also send out a link to this um i think that uh maybe dolly might have been doing some some note taking for us here um unless other folks were also in there too but um when you come in here and again please 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 share all the wonderful things you all are doing um so that we can we can learn from each other um if you look at the bottom you should see that we've got three separate sheets here um grab and go kit ideas because i know a lot of people have been doing that and i'm hearing that some some folks are feeling a little like they're they're running on empty for new ideas and so any ideas you have there if you are comfortable for with people contacting you to get more information um it looks like we've been sort of keeping track of who talked about that yes amy jane i will um share that google doc link again and then i will also put it in the email when i follow up um please feel free to include your email address or a phone number if you're comfortable with that thank you dolly dolly just shared that link again um there's also a page for paid presenters so if you just have people that you have really done well i put a rating in there one to five one being maybe not so much five being yes absolutely again not required but if you you know sometimes we we want things to go well but sometimes you know we have an unfortunate uh experience with somebody um and yeah and just some basic you know what type of performances um yes if they're offering virtual yes or no and then just a general programming ideas where we've got the program name what kind you know is it a craft is it a story time is it something else altogether and then any resource links that go with that um if the activity is in the CSLP manual, just a yes or a no, and so that way someone can sort of dive in. And again, if you're comfortable with people reaching out, if they have questions, um, contact information there as well. Um, but my hope is that you know once we've gone through all five of these brainstorming sessions, um, because normally when you're sitting in an in-person workshop, you have a chance to get together and fill out these, you know, wonderful programming worksheets where you're sort of building these ideas with one another um, and since we can't do that this year this is sort of um, just a different way to hopefully accomplish something very similarly where people can go in and, and get ideas and ask questions um, so yes so that will be a huge help um, three minutes and i did see one more question um, what are folks doing for prizes this year for K through five. <laughs> Our system is giving away, um, what was it? The Kindles, the Kindle Fires, uh, the kids edition for K through five, one at each one of our six branches or seven branches rather. And is it a random drawing? Is it? Uh, yeah, we use Beanstack. We, this will be the last year we're contracted through them, um, but you finish it on Beanstack and then it does an automatic uh, drawing on the Beanstack through the, uh, the administrator, whoever uh, is running it for us, um, and uh, we do it that way. Okay. And Jessica put in the chat, brag tags for turning in their reading log and their reading log doubles as a raffle ticket. We'll have three different baskets themed around the theme. Uh, Teresa said, more inflatable critters. We had inflatable dragons last year and they were very popular. Um, and if y'all are interested too, I can add another sheet. See, Heather and Rebecca, I, <laughs> what is so funny? I feel like yeah, I know you're talking okay. about. So our offices so we're are right in our next separate to each other. offices, but we're yelling at each other through the wall. <laughs> so I said we could give everybody kittens this year since they have tails, and then we were just cracking up. And then somebody said the dragons, and I'm like, oh yeah, they're not alive. That's probably a better idea. <laughs> so sorry, we're sorry. <laughs> I can't see myself. I'm starting to wonder, like, did I have food on my face? Or... <laughs> no, it's just us. This is how we are all the time. Um, and Ruth, they always give kids a book for completing the program, um, which is great. So, 
Yeah, and I can create an extra sheet if you all want on that Google Doc. Just I'll title it prizes. So any ideas you have, you can toss them there. So great. Well, it is time and we hit the hour mark. So thank you everybody so much for spending an hour with all of us. It's so good to see other human beings over the age of 18. Signed, stuck at home mom. <laughs> Um, it's going to be a great summer. It's, it's, yes, it's different, but you all did an amazing job last year with absolutely almost no prep time. So even though it's different, we have more of a heads up this year that life is still very different. So thank you for your hard work. Um, if you're in the other sessions, I'll see you then. If not, you know how to reach me. So bye.